Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Dan Rademacher. I'm here to talk about parks and OSM. And I don't know, someone wave your hands if I hold this mic too close to my mouth and drown you, uh, deafen you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, oops, wrong computer. I am going to talk about why I'm up here. Um, what's a park, what's in parks, and how can we map parks, uh, what's in parks, rather, and where some ideas about where we might go from here. Um, so why am I up here? Um, I've been working at sort of the intersection of parks and open space and storytelling and data, mostly as a journalist and less as a mapper uh, over the last 15 years, uh, but worked a couple years at Stamen Design. Uh, during that time, I collaborated with uh, folks at Stamen and Green Info Network, the organization of which I'm now executive director, on a statewide parks finder for California called Cali Parks. And uh, we use something called the California Protected Areas Database, which is, uh, I'll talk more about that later. Um, and harvested photos from Instagram uh, with a lot of work from Alan McConkie and Seth Fitzsimmons on how to do that. Uh, and also then pulled in trails and parks amenity data from OpenStreetMap in our base map uh, for that project. And so there's about, um, just for reference, there's about 13,000 parks and ex publicly accessible protected lands in California. Uh, managed by about a thousand agencies, so a lot of stuff. And um, but the problem we ran into is that in Marin County and probably other places, but Marin was the one who noticed and cared. Uh, some of the OSM trails were not authorized, and uh, particularly some that they really don't want on maps because they cause erosion into federal uh, streams that are home to federally protected salmon. And we weren't really in a position, in addition to liking salmon and. Um, having a lot of uh, history with parks and wanting to work with park agencies. Uh, <clears throat> the project itself also was closely associated with a, with a parks reform and, and sort of statewide parks revitalization effort. So we couldn't just say, like, that's the way it is. We had to try to figure something out um, to deal with it. And we, <clears throat> we sort of wrung our hands a little bit just because we also wanted, we could have just gone in and, and, and fixed just a few trails, uh, which is sort of what we ended up doing in the end. Um, but uh, we, we wanted to try to figure out something that would help further the discussion of social trails and OSM more generally. And so uh, Seth and I and Jeremy Monteau from Trailhead Labs ended up at a DOI, Department of Interior Hackathon, uh, and, and started working on, on this problem. How do we compare official parks, uh, trails data to, um, to OSM data? And you know, in a, in a day, mostly thanks to I'm a project manager and now an executive director. So mostly thanks to Seth and Jeremy, uh, we came up with a quick um, uh, sort of visual diff here, where uh, the pink lines are OSM trails that are not in uh, official data, and the yellow lines are are official trails that are not in OSM, and the white lines are are in both. And you can see sort of even little areas where they differ a bit, but the, the big pink lines were, were the main concern. And what we did after the, the hackathon, and, and uh, we being really Stamen and me, um, we proposed a new tag that uh, didn't go over very well, as some of you might have seen on, on various uh, lists. And this was certainly my sort of first direct real interaction with doing more than very minor edits in OSM. And um, it inspired, I guess, a little bit of press, uh, probably more press than it really merited, um, and, but it did then get noticed. <laughs> and particularly a phrase like Cali Parks hits mute on unauthorized trails. Um, and, and so that became sort of a center of controversy. And uh, it, was, it was, I mean, it's all fine in, in my opinion. And you know, the, ultimately this social path tag wasn't, wasn't a great idea, perhaps, and wasn't accepted. Um, but um, it inspired for me conversations uh, and um, this idea. I mean, around the same time, actually, I was just learning about missing maps and the idea of of OSM as a central and shared store for um, for public agency data as well and infrastructure data uh, for a greater good than, than, not to say than just mapping the world. But anyway, it started to connect dots for me of like other ways that, that we could be trying to, to push for OpenStreetMap to be used by public agencies and, and for public interests uh, around parks. Uh, but it's not so easy, I think, to figure out how to bridge the culture differences between the OpenStreetMap community and between a crowdsourcing uh, 
a fundamentally democratic and sometimes chaotic effort and um, agencies who own land and manage land and don't have a lot of staff. So like one land manager in Marin said this, look, it took me five years, but I finally found someone at Google to talk to and they fixed their trails data. Just tell me who I can call at OSM. And, um, <clears throat> and so, uh, and that, you know, I tried to talk about, well, joining the community and this, and, and in some ways I have to say, I'm not sure I was really walking the talk of, um, of joining the community, although Mikkel uh, encouraged me to um, uh, put in for this talk, so hopefully this talk is part of walking the walk as well as talking the talk. Um, and, um, and so now I'm running this organization, Green Info Network, and on the side I also do this um, volunteer thing called Nerds for Nature, and so at Green Info Network, we're sort of deeply enmeshed in boundaries data for parks, and we manage the California Protected Areas database, where parks are, and work with a lot of small to medium-sized land trusts and, and other agencies that often have very zero, uh, very little, almost zero technical capacity, um, certainly when it comes to uh, coding and interactive development and data management. Uh, and then Nerds for Nature is a place where we, it's all volunteer, it's kept on a very sort of low burner so that we can um, experiment in kind of low stakes ways and with new ways to gather data for parks. And so what's in a park, well, what is a park is one of the first questions and we can, in the, the history of the, the protected areas databases that we work on at Green Info are really from a conservation and land use, well, land acquisition planning perspective, so they can get pretty arcane about what is a park, although from a GIS sort of um, conservation acquisition planning perspective, what is a park in OSM is also sort of arcane and a little hard to understand. These are things that I pulled out as, as possible park type things. Um, and yet the, the protected areas database of the US, which I'll talk about a little bit more, I mean, it has a, a more, to me, legible definition, um, but it's not necessarily any easier. So terrestrial and marine protected areas dedicated to the preservation of biodiversity, recreation, cultural uses, um, and, and managed for these purposes. So, um, and then PADUS, which just came out in a new version within the last month, has about 135,000 parks, preserves, and other protected areas, and other uh, I'm going to say 50,000 designations, like wilderness designations and conservation easements, which are sort of overlays on top of ownership of, that restrict use for conservation. So certainly folks that uh, I've talked to over this weekend who are working on collecting public lands boundaries using PADUS, or, or at least starting with it, is a great idea. And Trust for Public Land has a, a several million dollars in funding to build out that data set down to a much smaller uh, park level uh, across the whole country over the next two and a half years. Um, so we can sort of map public lands in a very complete way uh, with PADUS in an increasingly complete way. Um, and we can also, there's a system of state stewards um, so that for Washington we can say that Shelley uh, Cinder, I don't actually know her, uh, is, uh, and this, this, these pages for each state will be live on a new uh, version of a site called protectedlands.net just as soon as the USGS gives us the okay to publish it, which has been pending for about six weeks. Um, so we have this sort of system of state stewards to help collect this data for each state across the country. Um, and so this is coming out of the USGS gap program uh, based in uh, Boise, and we're working on it. Trust for Public Land is working on it, and there's a lot of other folks working on it. And there's some, the FGDC is, is agreed to use it, the future recreation.gov is supposed to use it, uh, other, you know, CDC is, is interested in it. And um, the question though, I mean, all of those groups don't, well, I shouldn't say that. It's, it's hard to figure out how much any of those groups is particularly interested in getting that data into OpenStreetMap. And I've been sort of questioning myself this weekend, like how important is it to have boundary data in OpenStreetMap? You can't see it. Um, it. It's hard to really verify it if you're not an expert or you're not a landowner. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but we certainly find that there's a lot of good uses that can be done with, with boundary data, whether it's habitat connectivity or parks equity mapping. Um, and also, I think, um, just knowing that parks are the 
like regular people identify with parks, uh, even if they don't particularly care where the boundaries are, but trying to figure out how close they are to a park. Um, if you don't know the extent of that park, it's hard to say. Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of good reasons to try to have good park boundaries in, in OpenStreetMap. And we did a quick map just showing uh, for California how different is uh, Pad US from OSM. And so some of these gray areas here are public land that, uh, or lands marked as, as parks in, in OSM that as far as we know are not public land and these bright green areas are public land as far as we know in, in CPAD but not in OSM. And, and this is down near LA where um, <clears throat> in the southern San Joaquin Valley you have a lot of, of missing public lands. Um, so, so we know, and I would say within cities, it's probably going to, well, within well-mapped cities in OSM, you're probably going to have a lot less missing, um, but some of these hinterland parks are, are missing. So um, there's definitely ways to, there's areas to improve public boundary or park boundary data in OpenStreetMap. Um, and I, I had originally said that Pad US to myself and in my draft slides that, that park boundaries are basically a solved problem because of Pad US. It's not really true, though. Um, USGS provides a home for that, and there's state stewards that provide a structure for, for doing this on a nationwide level, and you can download it, and my slides will be on my on, on Green Info's blog, which I have a link to later. Um, but they're only sort of solved. Uh, I'm, TPL is, is working through 2019 to complete those, and they have funding for that, so that's great. Um, the data structure is really complicated. If you download it, you'll find tons and you'll either get a GDB or tons and tons of shape files with 14 different flavors that either do or don't include easements and do or don't include it marine protected areas. And there's documentation for all that, but it's not simple and it's not easy. And so I've been asking me these my, myself these questions of can we get the boundaries into OSM? Should we get the boundaries into OSM? Should we publish them separately in OSM format or in some other format? And so I'd be super open to feedback on, on what's possible and feasible and desirable in all three of those areas as we work with, um, with USGS over the next several years to, to build this data set out. Um, that only gets us the boundaries, like what's in a park. So this purple is the boundary and what's in a park is actually what people use and, and visit and can see and can verify. And I think that's really where OpenStreetMap can add so much to um, to public lands mapping. Uh, most agencies just don't have, some of them think they can map this stuff, but they don't have the resources to map it. They certainly don't have the resources to keep it up to date. Um, and uh, so, so how to bring these two, two threads together. And uh, so I've been looking around and thinking about this and it seems like there's people going big on this, particularly as we've heard this weekend. I feel like if I just wait long enough, some smart computer vision people will figure out how to extract all the park facilities I'd ever want from from, uh, from remote data. Uh, there's other folks like Trailhead Labs who are working with agencies to publish their trails data in a standard format that's much more consumable than most trails formats. Uh, so the, to the extent that those, those spread, I think that's, that's helpful. And then I did a little basically through Nerds for Nature, you know, low stakes experimentation, easy stuff. Um, tried a photo survey in a park that we're working in in San Francisco. Um, can we make it really easy to go out and um, take a lot of photos of a lot of things in a park that the agency cares about? And, and this was really based on um, grassroots bio blitzes that I've, I've helped uh, pioneer through Nerds for Nature where we get people out into parks using an app called iNaturalist uh, to get as many observations of plants and animals in a park in two or three hours as we can. And between us and the California Academy of Sciences, we've probably done about 30 of these. And in two days, you know, which has elapsed about five hours at, at McLaren Park, for example, we got about 3,000 observations of 400 species of plants and animals. Um, and so how can we do similar things for photo surveying. And um, reflecting uh, the talk earlier today um, about uh, Georgia Avenue and, and the, the youth photo mapping, sort of similar lessons that we've learned in the process of bio blitzing, which is find a local partner who cares about the park that we're going to be in uh, and will use the data in some way and has an ongoing interest in the park and connect us to people who already knows the, know the park. And so we've done that in McLaren over the last two or three years. And then <clears throat> for this one, Basically, we just had people taking pictures of benches, playground facilities, um, uh, restrooms, curbs, 
bollards that might prevent um, uh, access, things like that, and then just ax extracted the lat longs, made a quick CardoDB map, uh, was able to show that to the, the folks who participated and very quickly show them the results and then enter those results into OSM and get a lot of improvements in that park. Uh, this is a park also that, that the city of San Francisco is about to invest about $12 million in, so they're able to use these photos. In the INAT world, we call these, and in the museum world, we call these voucher specimens. So you can go back and say like, okay, this is a bench, yes, it has a back, yes, it's also a graffiti problem, and it doesn't look like it's in great condition. Uh, so I can supply those to the city, knowing that they're planning investments, and supply those to park advocates, knowing that they also wanna be able to fight for particular kinds of improvements in parts of that park. Um, so, I mean, the, the photo survey method, I think it, it was really fun, it was easy, it was welcoming. Uh, there were easy ways to provide benefits both to OpenStreetMap and to the agency. Um, hard to scale, 12,000 parks in California, not to mention the other 135,000 or whatever I said. Um, so, that's, that's my experience of, of parks and OpenStreetMap over the last uh, four or five years. Um, and so my big questions are, how can we continue to publish the Protected Areas Database of the United States in ways that are easier to consume, uh, help get more information into the in public boundary data into OSM, and do some of these mapathons that are um, easier, more frequent, and benefit both agencies and OSM. Thanks. Questions? Any questions for Dan? So back to your original, uh, some of your early comments about trails. W did you ever come up with anything satisfactory in terms of tagging informal slash social trails? Or oh yeah, I kind of skipped over that because I managed to garble my notes. But um, the 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 resolution there was to. I mean, I think this was already probably somewhat common practice in many areas. Uh, access equals no. Um, I mean, I, I would say we were. Uh, the, the, the thing that I've found challenging is most of the agency partners that I've talked to about this particular issue, including one I had to say I just can't do that project for you, is they want to just delete the trails. They don't want them ever on any map. And so access equals no, I would say, is acceptable within the OSM community, um, and that's fine. Uh, I haven't really figured out how to make it accessible, acceptable to the folks within some agencies who are particularly sensitive to this issue. So yep. working with land managers, uh, is there like a breakdown of what proportion uh, know what open OSM is when you first talk to them and um, what percentage consider it supportive of their mission, their interests? That's a good question. Um, most of them I would say are aware of it and a little wary um, and mostly feel like it's another place that they need to worry that things are going wrong. Um, and that they have to figure out how to deal with it. And partly with the photo survey thing and giving that data to the city, I mean, it's not, it's a drop in the ocean, but trying to figure out some way to say like, okay, you get this and the map improves at the same time, trying to provide some direct, I mean, there's sort of the philosophical benefits, but trying to find some direct immediate benefit that they would get from that. Um, I agree with that. I think one thing I've wondered is if uh, turn by the, if a proliferation of turn by turn trail directions would, particularly if they're OSM based, would sort of turn the corner on on land managers' wariness of OSM. Like if people are not able to follow the directions in the field because it's not clear what they're supposed to do because the map doesn't reflect reality, um, then that that maybe as a solution. I mean, I think some of this is just, frankly, pure like culture of we own the land, we control it, and we're responsible for it, and we don't have enough resources to put the signs up in the places that we're supposed to, and can we just not have it on the map and I can worry about the rest of my job. Um, but I don't, you know, I think there's a lot of logical reasons to have the, that data available. There's firefighting, there's egress during emergencies. I mean, there's, I think we can make a lot of 
of arguments, and then there's also just the, the sort of general sort of fright. I mean, to me, I just want to, like, if we can figure out big benefits to give to the agencies from, from OpenStreetMap data, that might get them over it, even though there were logical arguments to convince them otherwise. Yeah, I have a question for you back here, Dan. Thank you. Uh, I can think of one benefit, and it's not having somebody get lost on the trail and die like the lady did on the Appalachian Trail. She was close to the trail, she got turned around, she got lost from her friend who knew where to go, and there she is dead. So I would suggest perhaps putting points in and putting the information on the points virtually so that someone could download the information, go out on the trail, and when they get to a point, it would say, you know, turn left this way so many miles to what, or turn right in the other way you know, so many miles to the next thing. I think that would protect them from the horrible publicity associated with their particular area. Yeah, um, I think I understand the point. I, I mean, I think the, the flip side that, that we've heard about with unauthorized trails on maps is if someone walks on an unauthorized trail and dies, then who's, you know, who's responsible for that? And, and if they had stayed on the, the marked and maintained trails, you know, maybe they started down a trip, you know, and, and it's, a lot of this is like, the map reflects problems in reality, right? And a problem in reality is especially when a, when a social trail starts out looking great. I mean, I've had this experience myself where it was, it looked like a perfect trail. I started walking down it and within about half a mile, it became clear that it was a crazy, super steep, weird bootleg micro, uh, mountain bike trail with amazing jumps and stuff. And, and, um, and it was nuts, but at the beginning, it looked like as well-maintained as every other trail. So um, how do you, you know, is the map the problem there or is, is the trail maintenance the problem? How did you collect your BioBlitz data? Did you have data collection software on phones? Oh, the BioBlitz? Yeah. BioBlitz in particular? Um, I, can, I will happily do a commercial for the iNaturalist app, uh, which is housed in the uh, California Academy of Sciences. And it's a, I've actually been thinking about it a lot this weekend as it has, uh, basically it's a citizen science app that was developed by some folks out of the iSchool at UC Berkeley and then was eventually absorbed into uh, the California Academy of Sciences, and I forget all their stats, but there's about two, two and a half, three million observations in that, and, and they have a pretty interesting and well-established data pipeline where you put your data up, and uh, with a photo, if it has a photo, other people will try to ID it, and as soon as two people ID it, it becomes research grade and then feeds into what's called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, uh, which is a global network of, of biodiversity data. Uh, so when we think about, um, so I can have all kinds of people in a park, half of them are taking pictures of blurry crows, and half of them are taking pictures of all kinds of super cool stuff, and that totally works within the iNaturalist platform. Um, and the blurry crows just sort of sit there in their accounts, and maybe they get, and someday someone does a study of crow prevalence, and suddenly all those blurry crows become useful. Um, but anyway, that's how we do it. Okay. Thanks. Please thank Dan for his Wonderful presentation.